Welcome to Excess Returns, where we focus on what works over the long term in the markets. Join us as we talk about the strategies and tactics that can help you become a better long-term investor. Justin Carboneau and Jack Forehand are principals at Validia Capital Management. The opinions expressed in this podcast do not necessarily reflect the opinions of Validia Capital. No information on this podcast should be construed as investment advice. Securities discussed in the podcast may be holdings of clients of Validia Capital. Hey guys, this is Justin. In this episode, Jack and I sit down with Larry Cunningham, author of multiple books on Warren Buffett, to reflect on the life and legacy of Charlie Munger, the Berkshire Hathaway vice chairman and longtime partner to Warren Buffett. Larry shares with us where Munger had the most impact on Buffett and Berkshire, how he helped evolve Buffett's investing style, some powerful and timeless Munger advice, and the way that he looked at the world, business, and life. We appreciate Larry coming on on such short notice, but anyone interested in Charlie will like this discussion. As always, thank you for listening. Please enjoy this discussion on Charlie Munger with Larry Cunningham. Hi, Larry. Thank you very much for joining us today and coming back on Excess Returns. Hey, Justin, Jack. Great to be with you. Usually when we have you on, we're talking, at least in the past, we've talked about Warren Buffett. We've talked about high quality shareholders uh, and the shareholders of Berkshire Hathaway. And those are um, things that you have a lot of knowledge and wisdom on. And so um, when uh, Charlie Munger passed away and we were thinking about who we could have on the podcast to talk about Munger, his life, his legacy, his contributions to uh, just investing overall in Berkshire Hathaway, you know, we, we really thought of you as the first person, just given, you know, how much time you've spent thinking about writing about Berkshire Hathaway, Warren Buffett, and, you know, Charlie Munger's only an arm's length away. So really appreciate you coming on in short notice and and, and talking about this with us. Of course. Thanks. Where we sort of just wanted to, and you know, we'll, we'll get into all the things about Munger, but I just, to set it up for people that don't know, um, Charlie and Warren had worked together for, for decades, but what was Munger's background prior to, uh, joining Buffett at Berkshire? He grew up in Omaha, Nebraska, um, went to the so same town that Warren Buffett grew up in, although they didn't know each other till much later, but um, similar education. They went to the local, um, well, Charlie went to Central High School. Warren, during that period, actually moved to Washington with his dad. So, um, but that the similar culture, similar community. Uh, Charlie's uh, dad was a lawyer. His father was a federal judge. Um, he uh, graduated from Central High School, um, I think, with um, a strong sense of ethics and sort of Midwestern roots and appetite for reading and learning, which he, he developed there. Um, and he went off to the University of Michigan, uh, majoring in math and studying physics as well. Um, ended up leaving early, leaving without his degree, joined the army, World War II. Um, and after, after he got out, uh, after the war ended, he, he went to Harvard. Law, well, he tried to get into Harvard Law School and the, the first time he applied, they wouldn't let him in because he didn't have a college degree. Um, but then he reapplied and got some recommendations and got in. <laughs> and, 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 and so, you know. I don't know if he was first in his class, but he was very top, top of his class, did, did a great job. Went on to, uh, you know, he had law in his genes with his dad and his grandfather. He went out to L.A. Um, practicing law uh, and eventually started his own law firm with some friends uh, called Munger, Tolles, and Olson. And there was a, also a um, Rod Hicks was also one of the original founders. And I got that, you know, got that going. Um, and then one a vacation, and so he, he was doing well, and but then he he, he was kind of I think a little um, uh, antsy. I, I think he liked that fine, but he was he was really interested in investing and in, in business, and so um, when he when he met Warren, uh, that was the catalyst for that for a big pivot. He sounded like one of those guys that would have been successful at pretty much anything that he would have wanted to do in life, just given the knowledge he had. Yeah, I mean, Munger, I, I always think of, of him as a polymath, that there's someone who's, who's, who's good at a lot of different things, can play a lot of different positions. And, and he, he made that his um, intellectual trademark. I mean, what he, uh, he attributed his investment success and what he 
encouraged every other aspiring investor to do was to learn the most important um, topics within each important discipline. So <laughs> he called it the, the lattice work of, of mental models. So you know the fundamentals of, of math and of physics and of engineering and of biology and of accounting and finance um, and computer science and political theory, you, you know, all, all the basics in me, as many fields as you can, uh, they start to overlap, interact and amplify and, and reduce your propensity to make mistakes, to, um, to overlook important details and, and to see analogies and stuff like that. So, um, I, I, you know, success in any field, uh, Probably, and certainly, you know, he was successful in, in quite a few. I mean, that, that law firm, for example, um, is, I'm sitting in a law firm now, so I don't want to <laughs> uh, create competition, but it's one of the great, one of the best law firms going. Um, and, you know, he, he had a hand in it the whole way. Um, he, he also created his own investment firm called, called Munger Wheeler. He ran it for about 12 or 14 years, had a great track record. It, it ran into the the, the depths of the mid seventies um, economic trough. So decided to pivot and get out of that and work with Warren. Um, but then, you know, he founded a couple of businesses, advised uh, Warren over the years, um, and you know, had, had his hand in a lot of things, architecture, education, writing, philanthropy. So I think, you know, polymath is a good word for it. And, and how did uh, Charlie and Warren, what, who, what was the catalyst that kind of brought them together? I, a dinner party in Omaha hosted by some mutual family, a family that was mutual friends and someone in the family, it was the Davis, Davis family, uh, someone, and I forget the exact details, but someone said, who knew them both said, those two have to meet. They, they're both a little, they're both unusual and they're unusual in similar ways and um, they'll hit it off. And, and so it was a dinner party, and, and they did. They instantly noticed <laughs> something about themselves and the other one, but also some differences, some complementary strengths that, um, you know, they're both, both rational, analytical, intellectual, learned, bookish. Um, uh, but then they had a little different MOs around um, uh uh, 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 so, so applications, priorities, uh, relationships, uh, orientation, stuff like that. They were, um, you know, Charlie was sort of a more, I call it leaning out um, kind of personality, uh, a bit more aloof, a, li a little icier. Uh, Warren's, I call it leaning in. He is more more engaged and uh, first to tell a, a, a joke in a in a group and um, amiable and so. They they just but the the you know, the core disciplines were were very much alike and they 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 laughed in different ways but they I think you know instantly hit it off and and then became you know the best of friends. Last time we were on the podcast, we asked you about the key attributes that made Buffett successful, and you mentioned two: one was absorption, and two was discipline rationality. I'm wondering if I asked you the same question about Munger, what would you say? Well, that's not thanks. That, those are features they share in common. So I'd I'd, I'd lead with with them as as well. And, um, and absorption, you know, with Munger, uh, he was a voracious reader. Buffett reads all the time too. But Munger used to joke that he was a book with legs. His grandkids thought he was a book with legs legs attached. He was reading um, uh, all the time with, with uh, deep uh, deep interest and and swiftness and 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 kept it all uh, so absorption, you know, high, high absorption right there. And, and the discipline rationality, his whole con concept of the lattice work, the reason it's valuable to um, absorb the key lessons from multiple subjects is that it promotes rationality. It reduces blind spots, it helps control biases. And so, so he, he um, made a conscious commitment to that, to that sort of uh, thinking clearly and and, and rationally and keeping your, your biases in check. So I'd say those two things really um, define each of them and maybe the two most important characteristics of, of each of those guys. Yeah, one of the things I learned from Munger a lot too was the idea that he always recognized that luck plays a role. You know, those guys are two of the best investors ever, Buffett and Munger, but they still would always say, 
you know, part of this was luck. And, you know, whenever I think I'm too good of an investor, I always have to go back to that to say, like, if Buffett and Munger recognize how important luck is, I should probably do that, too. Yes, I, I think you're right about that. They certainly have said that. And I think it's 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 true and, and helpful to remember. I, th- I think at the same time, you know, one of the things, one of the differences I'd say between Warren and, and Charlie is War- Warren Warren's sense of has a pretty strong sense of humility um, that Charlie really didn't have. That was sort of a big difference. And so, uh, uh, you know, uh, Charlie knew that he was off the charts smart. Uh, He knew that he had this high rate of absorption. He knew that he could probably sustain a a discipline rationality, you know, in an ultimate way. Um, so he recognized for sure that luck, luck plays a role. But I, I remember one of the most important contrib- things I remember him doing for Berkshire was he, he wrote a um, retrospective on Berkshire Hathaway for the 50th anniversary annual report. And a, a key question was, what accounted for, you know, what, why was this company so successful? Uh, you know, we could talk about it more if you want, but he, he lays out the elements of the system and, and, and those elements had a lot to do with it. But then he, st- he stepped back and said, but okay, that, that only got you so far. There's, there's something else that really pushed this up there. And he said there were four things. He said the constructive, pecu- that's his phrase, constructive peculiarities <laughs> of Warren Buffett, the constructive peculiarities of the business organization that he designed, the weird devotion of the shareholders and other admirers, including the press, and for luck. And, and his next sentence is, and of those four things, the first three were most important. So, so he, there's to be sure, he, Lady Luck is there, but I think he really thinks, now, and he's not talking about himself, and they see these three things are other, other people. So um, uh, maybe it's, I, I, you know, it, there was, he had a tiny uh, element of modesty. <laughs> so, but what he's talking about, Warren and the company and, and the shareholders, um, it was really about, I mean, they, they, they got lucky a little bit, but mostly it was their constructive peculiarities and weird devotion that made this, this, this uh, company a you know, galactic success rather than an ordinary success. When you look at Munger's influence on Buffett on the investing side, what do you think the biggest thing you know he changed about Buffett on the investing side was? I, I think it's everyone would agree, and Warren has said, um, and, he, and Munger has accepted, his emphasis on business quality over investment price. Um, up until 1972, Warren had taken very seriously the philosophy of Ben Graham to emphasize price. Uh, and it made all the difference in an investment to Warren. So he'd be willing to buy a lousy business if he got it for a super cheap price. And um, what, what Char- Charlie said, wait, you're gonna, you're gonna miss a lot of really wonderful opportunities with that kind of formula. You should look as much at the quality of the business, maybe even more. You should, might be able to be, you know, pay up, uh, pay a, a, a fair price um, for a good business. And, and not always look for getting that good price for a fair business. That, that was pivotal. So, I mean, the, the transaction was Seize Candy's company is a $25 million set, uh, ticket, uh, which was a little pricey uh, in terms of multiple of what it was used to paying. And it was for paying for the, the franchise value of that confectionery, con, that chocolatey product that had a, a, a real powerful brand name in its market. Um, uh, they had pricing power. They had uh, uh, durable uh, co- uh, loyalty customers. Uh, the the secret recipes. I mean, it, that had a moat that had good returns. Um, uh, it was a family business. It run well. Um, it, it didn't have a lot of hair on it. It was it was. Uh, but they asked for a high price. <laughs> Warren didn't want to pay. Uh, Charlie persuaded them to. Um, it turned out to be a very successful result as a business as, and as an investment. And Warren came away from that appreciating that, uh, that the, 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 the Ben Graham um, cigar butt approach, quality investing approach can pay off 
bigger. And, um, you know, and Charlie had learned those principles from Phil Fisher, a uh, famous author, uh, investor, author of that era, a little earlier. He wrote a famous book in 1958 called Common Stocks and Uncommon Profits. And he, he, he really promoted or developed this sense of paying up for quality that, that Charlie taught. You know, Charlie got Warren to embrace. And I, I, I think everyone, I mean, I think that's the consensus that that was Warren, uh, Charlie's biggest contribution to Warren's thinking. So to me, I'm, as someone who hasn't studied him as closely as you have, I mean, I see basically when I look at the philosophies of Buffett and Munger, I pretty much see close to 100% alignment, you know, in their investing philosophies. But I'm just wondering, for someone like you who's looked at it more closely, are there any key differences like in the way they view investing between the two of them? They're, they're, they're very slight. I, I agree with you, Jack. Um, but the, the slight differences of, of emphasis would be um, I, they're subtle um, and, uh, and slight. But I think, um, and, and besides this one, because the, the difference of, of where they started still persisted a little bit. I mean, Buffett remains a value-oriented guy at heart. <laughs> you know, he's, he's looking for that bargain. And Charlie remained a you know a, a milk and turtle quality business guy. Uh, so so that, that that even that is was a persistent difference. I think um, you know Munger was uh, a little more willing to take a chance. I think he'd be um, willing to go into tech a little earlier than Warren. A little uh, go into emerging economies uh, a little earlier than Warren. I, I think um, he leaned towards China. Um, you know, Warren was a much more emphatic um, devotee of the circle of competence of saying, here's what I know and, and, and beyond this, I can't go. And then he'd be very firm about not going beyond this. And I think Munger, you know, he's reading all the time. He's, he's learning all the time. He's picking up new things all the time. He was a little more willing to say, yeah, I think I actually have a pretty good handle on this. I'm willing to do it. So just, again, a slight, it's not, it's not a huge philosophical difference, but I, I think a slight uh, difference of, of that sort. Yeah. And on the circle of competence thing, I mean, he probably was an influence on that because Buffett did. I mean, Buffett didn't go crazy in expanding his circle of competence, but over time, you know, he did expand his circle of competence. He did invest in tech eventually. You know, do you think Mugger was a big contributor to that? Yeah, I, I think so. I, I think there were many factors. I think the, that pivot or that, that shift was less um, pronounced than at C's Candies, you know, where we, you know, a singular one off where they really had a heart to heart conversation about it. I think the evolution into into the willingness to invest in technology companies like Apple's the spectacular example um, evolved over a longer period and had many more influences, many more factors, uh, you know, in, including that Warren himself started to appreciate that there's I mean, his aversion to tech was wasn't tech itself. It was the the dynamic uh, pace of change and innovation, the potential for disruption that's extremely hard to predict. And so it, it wasn't like, I don't understand tech. It was like, it can change in a minute. And I, and I, I can't think about uh, three, five, seven years out. And so I, th I think um, one thing that changed was it was it became pretty clear, even to ordinary people, that Apple had, had a product with durable competitive advantages. And so um, come what may, that asset, that franchise, probably going to deliver sustained value over long periods of time. So he was able to just sort of see it. And then he had other influences, including the portfolio managers in, in his team. Um, but but you're right, absolutely, Jack, that, that Munger certainly encouraged that inclination and, and, and um, supported it. So that was an important factor. You mentioned C's Candies before, and I was just wondering, like, if you look at all the Berkshire investments Munger was involved with over his career, do you think there's a signature investment for him that, like, was the most defining, like, the way Charlie Munger was as an investor? I mean, was it C's? Was it something else? I, I think it was C's, yeah. I mean, but he also, you know, obviously is associated with um, picking uh, stocks in uh, Costco. I, th I think he's very, you know, somewhat independent, but parallel with Berkshire. Um, you know, understanding the unique uh, value proposition of that uh, of that franchise, and uh, so I, I'd, I'd count that up there. And of course, he ran he ran Westco Financial uh, for for a long time with 
Berkshire subsidiary. So, um, and that was, in, you know, ended up being small in the scheme of things, but it, it, his uh, stewardship of his selection of that investment, his stewardship, and, and you know, it made a number of add-on acquisitions. So, I mean, that's, if, if we wanted to sit down, hey, let's, let's, let's try to zero in on some things that he had the greatest hand in, I think looking at Westco in particular would be productive. Yeah, and he also seemed to, as you mentioned, like Costco seemed to be something he really loved. Like whenever I would hear him interview, and I just listened to an interview in preparation for this with him, like he would talk about Costco a lot. Like you could tell he really, really loved that business. It had a lot of the things that, that both he and, 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 and Warren, and, uh, you know, always, always look for. It's a high quality business. It's a strong brand, lo very loyal customers and programming around that. Fairly low capital intensity, high returns on capital, um, you know, growth pathways. And, and so it was... I, a very uh, compelling within his his approach to investment thesis. I would have loved to be like a fly on the wall. And like when those guys were trying, bouncing ideas off each other, like how that actually shook out. Like, the, you know, did Munger come in to Buffett's office or pick up the phone and say, well, hey, what do you think of this? Or if Warren was unsure about something, did he go to Charlie? Like, I think the dynamics of that relationship probably is is pretty awesome yeah i mean i was obviously none of us were ever with them when they were alone but right. but if you we were when there were a few other or a little group or a gathering and then we were there all there with seven thousand or forty thousand people and my sense is that their their conversation their relationship was the same at, at all those scales so yeah warren would call and say listen i I wanted to run this by you. Um, here, here's the opportunity. Here's who brought it to me. Here's what I see the economics to be. And, and Charlie would listen and listen and listen and and with you know that pithy style, you know, say, oh, "Go ahead, Warren. I think that's a good idea." Or, <laughs> "Oh, I don't know. I don't know about that. That sounds like the dumbest." Tell me, tell me, did you look at this? Did you look at that? And you know, so what you see on stage, you know, at the annual meeting where you know Warren's presenting a portrait or a, a, a philosophy or a viewpoint, and then Charlie will either say nothing to add, mm -hmm. just, sure, go ahead, uh, or, you know, just lean in a little bit. Um, not necessarily, I mean, Warren caught him the environmental well, note, man, because he, he would sometimes discourage it. He, I, Warren, I don't think Charlie would ever say no in, in that literal way, but would ask tough questions that would get Warren to rethink it. Uh, but in his very uh, laconic um, avuncular uh, sort of sort of manner. Yeah, the annual meeting is something I think will never be the same. I mean, he was he was such a huge part of that. Like the the two of them playing off each other, it was it was such a cool dynamic. You know, that is something that'll be very different. I mean, he'll he'll definitely be you know missed in a huge way at the next one. Yeah, it's it, you're right. There's just not not anything you could do. I mean, the the testimony to that on top of what you just said, Jack, is you know the annual meeting that we had, the second COVID annual meeting, uh, Charlie couldn't couldn't get to Omaha, um, but Warren really wanted to be sitting next to him. So Warren flew to LA, um, right? And so, I mean, that's how attached or intertwined the two guys are. So at this meeting in May, um, you know, they should, they'll have an empty chair probably. I mean, I'm sure Warren will go forward with it, but it's going to be completely different. Yeah, a couple other things about his investing philosophy I want to ask you about before I hand it back to Justin. One is one of the cool things I think about both of them is they've always had this idea of investing in things that do good. You know, they wanted, they wanted to avoid companies that weren't doing positive things in the world. You know, even if they thought they were a great investment, they could make a lot of money. They always avoided that type of company. Can, can you just talk about that a little bit? Yeah, I mean, that's, it's, it's, it's true. And, 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 you know, wait, Way before this has become fashionable, um, there 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 was one episode. They they mostly don't talk about investments they didn't make, um, and I so I won't I won't give the details. But there there was a concrete example. Um, I guess it was the 1980s, uh, and it was a tobacco company <laughs> that, that 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 they a large. Uh, position in a publicly traded tobacco company came available at an extremely low price and it would just been a sort of a private placement to them uh, just you know and, and 
for, for bad reasons, the economics were mouthwatering. You know, you've got an addicted client base, you know, with extraordinary um, brand loyalty and a, a uh, you know, an addiction really with, with enormous pricing power and all that stuff. And so from a pure economic investment perspective, it was a, um, what Peter Lynch used to call a 10 bagger or, you know, or more on and all. Uh, and they said no. Uh, because of the health reasons, and this is, you know, the attorney, the uh, surgeon general had already been out telling everybody it's, it's terrible for you, but it was it was before that that message had really gotten across to the country. So I think, I think that's a really good example, Jack. Um, you know, and I, I, you know, it's not as if they they're they're um, you know the the nuns uh, who are activist shareholders now, you know, making sure everyone behaves in exactly this way, but certainly they. They they had a uh, a priority on businesses that produced goods and services that people wanted and benefited from that protected their their workforces and try, tried to produce a, a congenial uh, work environment and, and you know, that that kind of I mean Munger became famous within Berkshire as the as the sort of um, the ambassador uh, or guardian uh, of Berkshire culture. Uh, and it included that theme, uh, Jack, that you're talking about, that, that you know, we, should, we should be contributing positively to the world uh, and all our constituents, not just try to, you know, with white gloves, make, make a fortune. <laughs> the other thing that struck me is his ability to admit he was wrong. And that's the hard, you know, in the world we live in in investing, you know, you see a lot of people who can't do that, who get, you know, stuck in a certain thing. I'm a certain type of investor. I love this investment and I just can't change no matter what. And there was a great quote in the Jason Zweig article that he wrote after Munger died, and it was, more than almost anyone I've ever known, Munger also possessed what philosophers call epistemic humility, a profound sense of how little anyone can know and how important it is to be open and change your mind. So can you just talk a little bit about that, like his ability to do that and that, how that influenced what they did at Berkshire? Yeah, I think um, that's a neat phrase, epistemic humility, because the, 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 you know, I earlier said humility wasn't his strong suit, and I was re referring to his mental faculties and his, his, his discipline around rationality. Um, this epistemic hum, uh, humility is, was crucial in you know, what I understand Jason to mean and what, what Charlie practiced was to recognize the inherent uh, uh, propensity for error in human beings. I mean, he saw it starting with markets that is as wonderful as they are at uh, producing prices and helping people exchange things. Um, they are bound, uh, they are prone to bouts of um, irrational exuberance or despair and, uh, and, and appreciating that, that, that error uh, propensity of, of aggregates of people and then appreciating that individual people um, make mistakes, that, that they are, there are biases. People will get things wrong. Um, heck, we, we live in an uncertain world. You, you, you can't know what's, what's coming. And so you're, you're, you're bound to... Um, miscalculate, over or underestimate things. And so that, that's what, epistemic humility, just knowing that almost no one, no one really can get it right. I mean, ever, I mean, all the time. So, so that's, I think, I think you're right about that. How he brought, you know, how, and, and Warren, you know, shares that epistemic humility, no, knowing that markets and people will make mistakes. And so how do you internal, you know, what do you do with that? Well, especially in investing and even just in managing people, um, you're go you know that you're going to make mistakes. You do the best you can. You do as much, um, you know, reasonable due diligence and analysis you can. Make make a hard-headed judgment. Check with your partner, and then pull the trigger or not. Um, you'll still make some mistakes. When you do, the key point is to not 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 kick yourself too hard. This is another. Day. Warren Warren kicks himself hard when he makes a mistake. Charles probably didn't kick himself that hard at all. But either way, know that you made it and learn what the what, what the error was and, and try not to do it again. Um, and I think, uh, you know, it does take a little bit that epistemic humility is an important part of that. Uh, a desire, uh, I think another important part of that for, for people, if you're, you're, you're trying to get better yourself, I do that, I do, is just, just try to have a, a appreciation for learning, try to read uh, widely, try to learn all of the, you know, the big, the important topics in, in all the disciplines. Um, the, you know, the, the, the discovery of knowledge 
had errors in it. People used to believe all sorts of things that aren't so. We still do. So there's an endless need to get better, to learn more. And so if, if you have an attitude like that, it's a little easier to cope with your mistakes and to admit them rather than to um, protect your ego. And, you know, with Munger, I, I mean, what they both have said that at Berkshire, the most costly mistakes uh, were, were things they didn't do rather than things that they did. Uh, he calls them uh, mistakes of omission rather than commission and um but they have examples of both uh, i mean <laughs> uh, um, charlie and warren both uh kick themselves for overpaying for um, dexter shoe company um they thought it was a branded moated um brand uh you know customer loyal uh oppor business well they missed and so they, they paid a premium they paid a, a seize type premium they they missed that with changes in container shipping and international manufacturing, that shoes were going to be much more cheaply made uh, in China. And so they just, that company got uh, destroyed uh, and the whole investment went poop. So they, they kicked themselves for not seeing around that corner. Um, uh, but most of what he kicked them, whether what Charlie was like, he said, you know, I, I wish I'd have bought more Coca-Cola in the 80s. I knew we knew it was a great company, but we didn't buy enough of that stock. He said, I wish I bought Amazon and Google. I knew they were good companies. I knew they had all the uh, all the moats I was looking for, but I I couldn't. I didn't pull pull that trigger. Um, he he they think he thinks they missed Walmart. Uh, knew it was a good business. Knew knew, but just didn't do it. So um, so he, he admits all that, and and he. You know, he says, gosh, if he hadn't made those mistakes, he and Warren, uh, Berkshire would be even, you know, <laughs> you know, two or three times as amazing as it is without them. Uh, I'm, don't you think that there, that, that hu humility and being able to own up and, and talk about those mistakes is one of the probably many contributors to why they have such a high quality shareholder base? Yeah, I, mean, I think, you know, what one of the reasons Berkshire was able to attract the high quality shareholder base was candor. Um, and I mean, it, there, there were a few things there. But, and I think the most important was when they did, when they took control of Berkshire Hathaway, um, uh, you know, it was new to them. They're, they're in the saddle of a public company that had been private partnerships before. Now they're, they're going to be running this public company, but they wanted to run it in that old fashioned partnership way. So they, they wanted to um, attract people who would feel that same sense of partnership that, that we're all in this together and we're all in it forever together. It's, uh, and we're going to, we, the Charlie and, and Warren, are going to explain things to you or are going to provide disclosure to you in exactly the format we would want it if the relationship was the other way around. And so they wanted... Um, candor and and it included as you as you're indicating there justin that you know we when we make a mistake we're going to own up to it and um they they made warren made quite a few other doozies along the way and um and he just just explained them directly to the holders and and so um you know and, and a lot of them were you know m most of them had had some um I don't know, element of time horizon in them, that there were, there were problems that could be resolved over some period of time. And it was a sort of, please, please stick with us. We'll learn from this mistake. We'll resolve the problems that arose, though it may take a few years. And so the, the, the quality shareholder you're, you're talking about is a, is a long-term uh, partner in this, um, in this venture. And, and Charlie and Warren, you know, consciously cultivated that cohort, the long-term folks investor, and they came and they stayed. <laughs> they're, they're still there. And being rewarded for that commitment. Um, Munger is known for these Mungerisms that these quotes that he, that there's probably dozens and same with Buffett, you know, you on Google, like Warren Buffett quotes, Charlie Munger quotes, and there's like websites dedicated to, to this because a lot of their there's so much wisdom in a lot of these things that they're saying. Like one of the things, um, you know, Munger uh, is quoted as saying is if you can get good at destroying your 
if, if you can get good at destroying your own wrong ideas, that is a great gift. Um, are there, uh, are there any mongerisms that sort of stand out to you? Yeah, you're right there. Thanks for that. And, and that, that's a, that's a good one. Um, and a lot of people can't do what he, what you just referred to so we're all guilty of, um, uh, confirmation bias and anchor anchoring effects. We all kind of like what we think and this part of, but be, so having an open mind about it is very important. I, I think a few, I, uh, you're right that there's, there are catalogs of them, but one that probably everybody knows that there's just warrants is, I think you just, one of us just said it, but when he, he used to say at the podium there, I have nothing to add. Uh, it might be the five words or the sentence that Charlie uttered more than any other five words and more than any other sentence. And it's a phenomenal thing. If you think about it, it's, um, and I'm, I'm guilty of it. I'm guilty of it right now. You know, if you don't have something intelligent or useful to say, <laughs> just shut up. You know? and a lot of us don't do that. And, um, yeah, and he did. What Warren had said it, there's no stop. So I think that we could all benefit from, from that one. It, uh, that, that, that advice is, is useful many times a day. So we, we can all benefit from, from that. Um, the other, just the more, a little more seriously, but, but, but also, yeah, as useful as his, his advice to invert, always invert. Uh, when he, you know, he's talking, I think he's drawing on Cicero there, some, some big idea that if you sort of work backwards, um, in 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 work in untangling a problem, uh, you'll almost always see it in a more productive light. Uh, so, and you can apply that aphorism, that mongerism, that wisdom in in an in infinite number of, of settings. Whether it's um, you know if you're you're writing out a sentence or a letter and it's just not make it's not working, or you've written the whole thing, you think you're done step back and flip the whole thing around and see if the last sentence shouldn't be the first and all of a sudden you'll see uh and you could you could do it in, in investing you know you just you know you start out with the post-mortem about you know, what, what 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 you know something terrible the t result's been terrible what went wrong so you you start from the other way around uh you know it's done in math and physics and other branches of science but that uh you know and he picked it up from somebody else look the other he he was intellectually humble in another way too. He he said, "I I actually didn't think of most of the things that I know. You know, I, I just read tons of books." And he's like, "That's what everybody should do because none of us can, can do all the all the great thinking." Um, so those are two of my favorite ones, Justin. Um, but they, you know, I've got a list. <laughs> my uh, my favorite one was always when you hear EBITDA substitute bullshit. <laughs> because I thought that was a good one. <laughs> yeah, that was like, a, you know, the, like the type of candor Charlie always had, like that, that was a great fit for that. Like, a, yeah. that, that was always my favorite one of his. That's a good one. Yep. No, that's a good one. Another way that I just, um, that, here's another one, you know, takeaway maybe for your, for your audience. Um, uh, you know, it's for, it's for, for every investor, but it's particularly relevant for, for us ordinary people who are investing and trying to build something and then have to, you know, pay for the kids' college and stuff like that. But he said, the, the first rule of compounding is to never interrupt it unnecessarily. So, um, you know, Buffett wrote that essay, The Joys of Compounding, and, and Ben Graham was all about showing how, you know, you, you save a penny or you double a penny every day and, you know, it's 20 million in, in 10 years or something. But I think his insight there, you know, it's so tempting for us. We, we make, make an investment, take, take a stake, uh, and, and that, that thing will, will grow. And if you let it, let it ride and grow and grow and grow. Um, but if, if you, and you get the magic of compounding, but if you reduce it, you know, you're pulling out of it, pulling out of it, you, you lose all of that. So he, it's just a big, if, if you can do it. And he clarified, qualified it by saying unnecessarily, obviously you got to send the kids to college. That's what you got to do. But I think trying to remember, um, uh, leave it in, you know, yeah. get the compounding. I, I think the other thing too, and it kind of goes to the comment of, you know, nothing to add. I mean, these Buffett and Munger, some of the sharpest, most intelligent investors, but they never 
they didn't like, I don't think they, they wanted it simple, simpler, the better. And I think in investing in a lot of times, it's the same thing. You know, we have a tendency to want to look at the most complicated, complex response, you know, solution, whatever it might be to investing. And, you know, a lot of times it's just taking a long-term view, buying good businesses, like you said, staying invested, you know, and I think that those guys really believed in that. Absolutely. I mean, to Munger used to like to quote Einstein that everything should be as simple as possible, but not more so. It's, and there's another useful aphorism or Mungerism. Well, I guess it's an Einsteinism, but it's still it's, it's really useful to cut through a lot of the uh, the, the tangle, the brush, or the bureaucracy when you're talking about a business organization. I mean, what one thing that Buff, that Birch, um, that Munger explained in his 50th anniversary letter in the Berkshire annual report that year was that uh, a, a very important element of the system was simplicity. So you've got one guy at the top and he allocates capital in the portfolio and makes these acquisitions um, of great businesses that then he gets great people to run and leave them alone. And that's pretty much it. You know, I mean, there's, there are a few more things to it, but it's push down, delegate, I have autonomy, have trust at the center of it all. I mean, Munger's letter is only three pages, right? It, it explains the entire system. Um, so it's a very simple, in, in, in a way, it's a very simple model. Or, or what they tried to do was keep it absolutely as simple as possible. This is probably like an unfair or impossible question, but do you think there will ever be a partnership and value creation like Buffett and Munger have well, done, what should hope? I mean, we, it, it certainly, I mean, they, they would want that to happen. I mean, I think mm -hmm. one of the other neat things that they gave us all, right, was uh, the knowledge, the, the references, the philosophy, the example, um, and a very large number of companies have at least tried to embrace parts of the model, including the trust-based approach, uh, decentralization, autonomy, integrity, you know, uh, and 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 I'm I'm, I'm on the board of uh, three companies that try to do that, and I, I think I, I admire the people who are running those companies, and and I I see them uh, taking and applying these lessons, um, and not just them. I, could, I I made a list of thirty companies that I think are in the ecosystem in in some sense. So I think that we can people we uh, and those guys can certainly um, learn from these two and um, vindicate their legacy, uh, whether we're going to, you know, but to your specific question, I, you're, you're never going to see an exact replica of what they did. Uh, the, the, the constructive peculiarities of, yeah. of Buffett and Berkshire and Munger are just, you know, the, the, they're, they're unique. So we're not going to have that. Um, but, you know, I think that at, at a, at a, at a different scale, we'll see. We'll see plenty of people, um, you know, proving that these ideas are um, universally useful and valuable. What do you think uh, Munger's legacy will be? Well, I, I, I'd go back to that first uh, first uh, question you, we were talking about. It is I think it's the legacy of a, of a polymath. This this guy. Um, you know, is towering intelligence um, and, and able to operate in a lot of different fields, drawing upon the important topics from a broad range of subjects. And so he was good at um, investing, business, um, architecture. Uh, you know, he was good as a family man. I mean, his family loves him. His kids adore him. Um, and so polymath, you know, and it's, it's hard to do that. These, it was, it was hard while during his time, but it's just really, it's really hard. There's a propensity to specialize. You, you get a lot of incentives around being you know, the leading expert in this particular area, whether it's uh, you know, cyber security or, or, uh, or, uh, climatology. <laughs> it's, it's hard to, to, um, have that breadth, uh, of knowledge, but that, that's the legacy. You know, what it means is, yeah, I mean, he, he did uh, um, educate uh, 
a very large number of people, tens, tens of thousands. Um, and, and as I said a minute ago, at least 30 or so companies are emulating those teachings. And so that the legacy, it might be a, you know, an actual tangible, real legacy of lots of companies and, and among lots of executives um, pursuing this, this sort of simple, rational, uh, focused approach to, to management and investing. Do you have any personal stories that really, that you'll always remember in terms of dealing with Charlie? <laughs> yeah. I mean, he's a character, you know, he's, um, I, I met him a few t many times over the years, mostly um, at, at the annual meeting at, at, at Warren's brunch on, uh, on Sunday morning um, that I, I went to for many, many years in, in a row. They suspended it a, a few years ago, it just got, got too big. Um, but he, 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 this goes back to the difference between the personalities here a little bit. There'd be, I, I, when I first started going in 1997, there may have only been 60 or 80 people. Warren called it the brunch for out of town friends. By the last time they had it in 2019 or 18, uh, there were about 400 people. Warren used to joke they had more people at the brunch than there were at the annual meeting in the first couple of years. But the, the, their MO was, was totally different. Warren, um, I, I call it the lean in. He'd greet people, make sure he'd say hi to everybody, he'd move around a lot, uh, especially in the early years. In the later years, he, he began to just try to sit at his table. But Charlie wouldn't do that. He'd just he'd sit um, at, in, a, in a nice chair over in the corner and basically have people you know, kind of walk by like a wedding party operation, you know, mm. uh, lean in, say, say hi to him for a few minutes. Uh, and he'd sit there and he'd dispense, you know, wisdom. I mean, some of it would be catching up. How are you doing? But for the rest of the day, he'd, he'd just sit there listening to people's business challenges uh, and, and give them advice uh, and, and, and help, uh, help solve it. Very you know, wise and sage and stuff, but also very generous. I mean, just sit there all day long. Uh, you know, and again, the, the other funny thing I remember at those brunches, and he was also like this, I had a conference on, on the Buffett essays in, in 1997. And, um, so we spent the whole weekend, Warren, Warren and his friends and Charlie. And so we had many, had several different breakfasts and dinners. And, and Charlie, uh, I mean, it's amazing he got to 99. Uh, he, he just, he, he was the, he'd eat anything he wanted. Piles and piles of eggs with piles and piles of bacon on top. That's, he'd sit there. <laughs> <laughs> We'd be having, you know, fruit and oatmeal. <laughs> and he's a pretty big, you know, he's a pretty big guy, he's like a farm boy. So, um, but just to me, at least, you know, when I was dining with him, he'd, he'd have a, an appetite for, for cuisine that almost equaled his appetite for knowledge. <laughs> so kind of, kind of funny. But yeah, I mean, the other thing you see, again, so to what you see is what you get kind of deal. You know, you mm -hmm. watch him on. He's on the stage or on on the uh, you know the various interviews they they like to do before and after the meeting, uh, he, he was uh, you know, he he loved to teach wisdom by storytelling and and the stories were always colorful and, and amusing and memorable and so the, the you know, those mongerisms that, that we talked about those those sort of wise sentences there's also a hundred like munger stories that we we could compile that that book and they're, they're, they're parables or fables they're, they're they, they always have a moral to them they're usually more than applicable to more than one setting um I'll, I'll just tell you one if you if you got another minute uh, yeah go for it it's it's about it's about human gullibility overall but also in in the consumer setting and it, the the context is as many of his stories were is a is a fishing trip where a uh, angler goes up to the uh, the tackle shop and he's looking around for help uh, for his outing and he, he's looking at the lures on on sale and he's he's marveling at the wonderful colors they they come in dozens of colors with really cool names like um, uh, sunset red and and uh, and brilliant gold and they're in different shapes like worms or, or tunas and stuff and the guy's like this is really amazing so he asked the owner he do these are really wonderful colors and shapes, but do the fish fall for 
this stuff. And the owner leans in in, in confidence. He says, listen, my friend, I'm not selling these things to the fish. <laughs> <laughs> exactly. Yeah. That's awesome. <clears throat> um, I don't know if you remember, we, uh, we always like to ask this kind of standard closing question. And that is, you know, if you could teach one lesson to the, to the average investor, what would that be? But I would like to ask you if Munger, you know, what would the one lesson you think Munger would teach to the average investor in today's market? Yeah, I think, I think <laughs> I would say get out of your own way. Um, he, he didn't. He didn't put it exactly that way, but but he could have. It's it's the mongerist mongerism like, get out of your own way. Um, but it, but it comes out of his emphasis on uh, the psychology of uh, investing, of trying to avoid the natural propensity to make mistakes, trying to assure that you have commanded a set of important ideas to minimize your um, accident rate, your error rate, um, and. It's really your, maybe it's the quote that you, you singled out, uh, Justin, about, you know, being able to um, uh, not make yourself the mistake. Uh, so a lot of us just keep doing the same old things. <laughs> We're our own problem. And so trying to, uh, trying to get out of your own way. Great. Thank you very much, Larry. This has been uh, excellent. We really appreciate you coming on and sharing um, you know, your stories, this wisdom from Charlie Munger, uh, you know, one of the, one of the best investors that's ever lived aside alongside Warren Buffett. And so we really appreciate it. Thank you. My pleasure. Thank you guys. This is Justin again. Thanks so much for tuning into this episode of excess returns. You can follow Jack on Twitter at, at practical quant and follow me on Twitter at, at JJ Carboneau. If you found this discussion interesting and valuable, please subscribe in either iTunes or on YouTube or leave a review or a comment. We appreciate it. Justin Carbonell and Jack Forehand are principals at Validia Capital Management. The opinions expressed in this podcast do not necessarily reflect the opinions of Validia Capital. No information on this podcast should be construed as investment advice. Securities discussed in the podcast may be holdings of clients of Validia Capital.